Well, hello, boys and girls. Here we are again with my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. But today it's our NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And we got freaking awesome, dude. Awesome writer. Um, we've done it. We've, we did it before and we loved it so much. We're doing it again. It's Jamie Baskell, writer for the Philadelphia Flyers. Fantastic writer for the Philadelphia Flyers. Been following him now for several years. And uh, I'm so happy for him to be doing as well as as well as he is um, and continue enjoying his uh, his work that he does. Also, he's now is doing a fantastic podcast as well. Are you not, Jamie Basco? Uh, you know, uh, I'm honored to come on for the Swami uh, because uh, your picks are like always spot on. And yes, this is a Swami here. So anytime you ask me to come on, of course, it's a yes, but uh, I'm honored to come on. But uh, yeah, we do have a good podcast called Getting Gritty With It, and uh, it's fairly new. Uh, we've done 14 episodes, uh, excuse me, st- staying corrected, 15 episodes. We're going on our 16th tomorrow night. Uh, we've had the uh, likes of Ruben Rofkin, a 2020 NHL draft prospect. He, play- he plays, uh, used to play for the Windsor Spitfires in the OHL, and now he will play for TPS in the Legal League. Um, he graduated from the University of Nebraska. And uh, honestly, look for him. I'm telling you, he's on the Flyers' radar. Uh, you know, that is an under-the-radar type guy. He's a right-handed defenseman that has size. He's um, about a six, he's six one one ninety. 190. Uh, guy could put the puck in the net. He's an offensive defenseman. Uh, not just an offensive defenseman, but he, obviously he's a good defenseman. So we are honored to have him on. We had Alex Appleyard on. We had uh, the voice of the Flyers, Jim Jackson, on for our podcast uh, about a month ago. So we've had some pretty high-profile you know, uh, guests. And we will have Steve on here in the coming weeks, hopefully. Uh, i got to set a date. Uh, see, that's soccer. Oof. Bomb wow. Shot. That's what my source is. Wow. Jeez. (laughs) That would be amazing, my friend. Uh, Like I said, I just love this guy. Check out the podcast. Um, You want to get, if you're a Philly fan and you're not watching this podcast, man, I don't know. You got to check it out. They go to every nook and cranny of this team. They have a passion for the team. And uh, the more I listen to it, the more Philly fan I become. Uh, like I said, Philly's not my number one. I, I live in Edmonton, so it's oh, the Oilers are kind of my number one team. But in the East, Philly certainly is. And uh, I, 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 I get busy, but I have watched as much as I possibly can. And every time, it's it's great stuff. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Um, okay, so with that in mind, we are. We are uh, getting into playoff time, of course, and uh, the players have been able to hit the ice now. Or is that what you're hearing? Or are they up on the ice now? Or Ivan Provorov will be given the keys to the skate zone tomorrow, eight o'clock a.m. I guarantee it. He's going to. He's a Yager-esque type player. Uh, oh. He will be the first one at that door. Cooch will be second. I guarantee they'll. Pro- Actually, you know what? They may ride up together with masks on in the car. Who the heck knows, you know? Both those guys are very hardworking. Pro, I do know for a fact that Ivan Provorov, Sean Couturier, Mark Friedman, and um, Sam, Samuel Morant will be there tomorrow for sure. Those are those are the gimmies. Those are the four. Uh, but I personally believe that Joel Farabee will be there. Kevin Hayes will be there, uh, who's coming down from Boston, I believe. And I also firmly believe that one goaltender, either Brian Elliott or Alex Lyon, will be there. And I'm probably leaning more towards Alex Lyon because he wants to, to get some, he wants to try to get some rubber. Or, you know, not saying he's not getting any in Minnesota or whatever, but uh, he knows that he's a black ace and he wants to be prepared. Yeah. Oh, geez. Every time we get, we talked about a good half, three quarters of an hour, and you bring up stuff I want to ask more and more questions. I, Alex Lyon is a late bloomer, but uh, we'll be we'll tr- at year's end, but he's only 27 years old. I, I don't firmly, I, I, I love Alex Lyon. Alex and I have a really good relationship. And when we talk, we talk for 20 to 25 minutes at a time. I, I've talked to him twice this year. Uh, in training camp, I only firmly saw him for a few minutes. We didn't get a chance to talk like that, but uh, 
we did uh, rekindle our friendship uh, in December and then in February, right before, you know, things shut down and whatnot. And uh, stand up guy, uh, class act. But uh, I firmly believe he moves on. Uh, he's Again, he's only 27 years old. The Flyers have Felix Sandstrom and Carlos Menko in their system right now. Uh, one of them will play, more than likely, will play for Reading. I've, I also believe that Chuck Fletcher will sign a veteran goaltender uh, to aid uh, Kirill Ustamenko, I think, with the Phantoms. I think okay. that Kirill Ustamenko will be given the reins and that a veteran backup goaltender might come in and, uh, you know, try to aid him along, you know, or whatever. I just don't. Alex Lyon is young is where I'm getting at. He's 27. He's looking for term. And he's played his way, way at, at the very least, into an AHL contract for multiple years with the team. Maybe like the New York Rangers, for instance, who are losing Henrik Lundqvist, might lose Henrik Lundqvist after this year. Uh, a team like the Washington Capitals, you know, who has some young goaltending down there, but they need a veteran goaltender. You know, I, I'm just throwing stuff out there. And, and the Capitals don't have the cap space, so he would be a cheap addition. And he would be a cheap, good addition, you know, to them, you know, just because he may not be in the Flyers plans to be a backup net minder doesn't mean that another team won't ask him to be a better, you know, backup net minder to Samson off, you know, is where I'm getting at. Or um, maybe even a team like Columbus, who, who, who needs a backup goaltender for Elvis, you know, over there, you know, the, the Metropolitan Division is where I'm keying up at here and maybe yeah. even New Jersey. You know, who needs a veteran backup net minder for, you know, Blackwood. Who, the, the, the Metropolitan Division has some really good goaltending here. Not only like Philadelphia has great goaltending in Carter Hart, uh, good goaltending by Blackwood, good goaltending by Elvis, good goaltending by Shusterskin. If I mispronounce his name, I'm sorry. Oh, that's you know, right. Uh, amazing the, yeah. uh, the only team that, you know, really has some goaltending issues. Uh, and Pittsburgh has some good goaltending over there with Matt Murray, who's won multiple cups, and Tristan Jari right now, is, who's playing well. Uh, the only team that seems to have trouble in Metropolitan Division goaltending is the Carolina Hurricanes. I'm not saying that they can't find any. It's just that's just the way the cookie crumbles. So where I'm saying is, is that Alex Lyon has some options, and I don't know if he would want to re-sign with Philly. I hope he does. And I hope he stays with the Phantoms to aid Kirill Usmanko. But in the same token, the young guys have to give, be given the reins. I don't know if Alex Lyon, where I'm getting at, is I don't know if Alex Lyon would want to be a backup at the age of 27 to a younger netminder. And would Felix Sandstrom be able to be the backup down there for the Phantoms? I don't know if Chuck Fletcher would just be okay with just having two young netminders be 1A and 1B you know, for, for, for your AHL affiliate, you know, he, one could play for the Reading Royals and then earn those stripes to th become the backup that minor at this particular time. I think Kirill Usimenko has proven himself to be the starter next year for the Phantoms. At, and in, in, in my, in my opinion, I think he had a fantastic year. He was one in three with the Phantoms. I understand that, but he was dynamite with the Reading Royals. Uh, he's adapted to the North American ice. Well, and I, I, I'm a huge fan of Kirill Usamenko and Sandstrom, for that matter. And it's not that, Sand, that Usamenko was far ahead of Sandstrom. It's just he's earned it more than Sandstrom, um, who came on late in the season, finally. And am I shocked to say that? Yes, because I thought coming into this past year, I thought Sandstrom would be the guy and not Usamenko. Not saying that Usamenko wouldn't, but... You could tell that Ustamenko worked real hard in the offseason in terms of getting bigger and stronger. And I'll tell you one area that people forget is that he is a skater. He's a good skater. And people don't, you know, I talked to Carter Hart about this. When Carter Hart played for the Everett Silvertips in 2017, him and I had a really good phone conversation when I interviewed him. And he said one thing that, that, that is uh, forgotten for goaltenders is that we are good skaters. And he said, I always work on my skating. And mm. you know how, you know how you know how that became true for Usamenko? The way he was able to move from post to post. He was a very good skater. Because you got to move fast and yeah. you gotta be strong in order to push off 
So he definitely got stronger, and but he was became a good skater to move to the post laterally. He was faster than I've ever seen him before. Mm. And I think those are two areas that I think he worked real hard on in the offseason. And I think, you know, maybe maybe Carter Hart may possibly talk to him about that. Who knows, you know? But um, I don't know. We get, This is interesting, you know? Yeah, uh, Lion, I, I, I mean, uh, the uh, where I'm from, the Oilers could use a guy like that down in the minors as well. He'll find a place. Yeah, yeah. He'll find oh, a place. Sure. He really and showed well. Does. What I'm getting at is that he isn't a backup at this time at the no, AHL level. No, He's a starter. No. He's proven he could be. Star. He could almost be a backup in the I, – I thought he, he showed pretty well this last he did, year. He did. He did. I just – I'm afraid to tinker with that Hart Elliott relationship, in my opinion. Uh, they really respect each other. They're friends oh, for, sure. for each other. If I'm Chuck Fletcher, I don't know if I want to mess with that. My, yeah. my, because if I'm Chuck Fletcher, and I know he's a smart man, and he's thinking this already, his, the franchise goaltender is happy. That backup netminder is happy. Right? They're happy with one another. They know, both know their roles. Why tinker with that? Because then you could bring in a Kadobin who could maybe want to push for the starting role. Who knows? Kadobin played well. And I'm not saying that that would happen. I'm just saying, you know, or, you know, a Thomas Grease who has played, you know, the starting level, you know, uh, through the Islanders, you know, Islanders, and he's a journeyman himself, you know, he may want to start. So then you got, you ruffled the feathers there. And, yeah. I, I don't know if I would tinker with that, you know? I wouldn't either. I think Elliot had a fantastic year, like a rebirth almost yeah. last year, too. Yeah. So why would you want to, I mean, to change have, that? Yeah. His numbers weren't the best, but his numbers didn't have to be the best. You know why his numbers weren't the best? is because he came in and cleaned up the trash. And, and that's what a backup netminder is supposed to do. They're not supposed to have light out, lights out numbers like Carter Hart did, you know, with the 2.42 GAA with a 0.914 save percentage at the young age of 21. Brian Elliott's not supposed to have those numbers. Brian Elliott's just supposed to be on the verge of a 0.9000 G save percentage with on the verge of the lines of anywhere from a, a 2.6 to a 3 GAA. That's what a backup netminder is supposed to have, you know? And, uh, it, it, I mean, he came in and cleaned up the trash. When the Flyers needed the big game, what happened? Brian Elliott was there. Carter Hart was hurt. Who was there? Brian Elliott was there, you know? And when uh, I found what A.V. did later in the season, too, is that he started giving Elliott big games. He like did. He was, yeah. he was starting he to give him big did. games. He was really showing yeah. confidence in, in, Elliot, yeah. in Elliott. And, uh, um, you know, because Elliott was doing, like you said, taking out the trash. When you're doing the second game on a back-to-back, -back, you know, your team's tired. You, it's those are tough games, and that's what a lot of people don't realize. Backups generally play with tired teams in front of them, and all that kind of stuff like that. So their numbers I mean, generally don't look as good. But if you can keep it above the nine zero zero, like you said, you're doing your job. And AV was so awesome to give him uh, like some confidence and say, you know what, go there and play against. I, I can't remember some of the teams he played against, but they were big games. Yeah, absolutely. And you want to know one of the biggest games was the Washington Capitals game. The Flyers need victory, right? And he was off for eight days when the when the Flyers played the Caps, right? Eight days off. And for you ask, and I'm not just saying you, if anyone wants to ask any netminder, how fresh do you think you'd be after having eight days off? They would tell you, uh, I don't know. I you know, I might come in sluggish because they yeah, need yeah. some trouble. I'm not talking about a practice. I'm talking about the rubber because at practice is practice. You're not hitting with bullets and stuff like that. You know, you're, you're doing that. You know, you don't want to injure your players. Now at times, you know, they have heavy slap shots and stuff, you know, but it's not consistent to whereas you do game action to where you're going with a wrist shot of like 75 to 80, maybe even 90 miles an hour, you know, you, you know what I mean? So like, uh, but um, he came in and what do he do? He was lights out against the Caps. He won that game 5-2. 5-2. 2 against the juggernaut in the Washington Capitals yeah. with a high-profile offense and held them to two goals. It was amazing. And that's yeah. the moment that I was like, uh. It wasn't just that moment, but that was the moment I was like, he's back. He's back next year. There's no way. Because yeah. 
you will, it is very rare to have a backup pep monitor with eight days off between mm-hmm. games to come in and play a juggernaut and win. And yeah. win. I was like, wow. But yeah. I, I thought it was a great move by AV and for, for several reasons. Yeah. Uh, you know, Elliot's been Earth. kind of almost a career backup. I mean, he was a number yeah. one in St. Louis yeah. for a bit, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So he he would know he would be a little more prepared and being a veteran to do that on a layoff. Yeah. But yeah. then it's just the confidence thing. And I saw that all through the year with A V giving him spots where it's like Look, we're not just saying you got to take the lower end guys and teams in the league. We believe in you. And that's amazing because what happens, you got a young goaltender there, Carter Hart, not likely going to fade in the playoffs. But what happens if he does? What happens if he gets injured? You want your backup like Elliot to have as much confidence in himself as possible. So you got to give him confidence. And he gives them confidence by gives them, giving them those big games. And yep. I love it. I love AV for that. He thinks it all through. He's got it all through. AV is a phenomenal coach. He's a smart man. And I, I want to say, you know, to some Ranger fans that hated on AV when they when AV signed, I know why they, they said that now, you know, that he would play the veteran hand. You know why? It's because they didn't want him with the Flyers because he's a good co- He's a very good coach. And yeah. if I'm the New York Rangers and I'm their fans, would I want him in the Metropolitan Division? Hell no. But I'll tell you this. He ne- that that really upset me in the offseason when people were making that comparison, saying that he he uh, played the veterans um, over the younger players. That is a lie. That is a lie because he never had a veteran-like team to play the veterans over the youngsters. You look yeah. at the Vancouver squad. He had a, a young Ryan Kessler. He had a young Roberto Luongo. He had a young uh, Sedin twins. You know, he had he, he had youth after youth there, you know, of, of, in Vancouver. And that's just to name a few because there were more guys as well. And, and then he, he goes to – yeah. he had a young Henrik Lundqvist. He had a young Kevin Hayes, okay? And, and it, it, I mean, those are just a few players. And then he had a young, you know, McDonough, you know, Ryan McDonough. You know, so th- there's, there's no way he played – you know, he had a young Matt Sucarillo, you know, and stuff. There's no way he could play the veterans because he didn't have the veterans to play. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they had veterans it's on that bit. team, but that I, is I don't know bit. where he got that from. Okay. I, I and if that were true, from. if that were true, why did he start Carter Hart at the beginning of the year in Prague? Yeah, yeah, exactly. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't. He started Carter Hart in Prague. He didn't start Brian Elliott in Prague. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, I think you just – in the end there, the Rangers were falling a little bit. They knew they had to rebuild, and everybody likes to blame the coach. And yeah. uh, I remember when that was happening, and I'm like, okay, you're going to lose AV, and you're going to bring somebody else in because you want to change the whatever. But I was saying at the time that you may not regret losing AV because you may bring in some great – yeah. another great coach or whatever the case may be. But if you are, if you're a person that's blaming AV, you are going to regret it because he's going to go somewhere and he's going to do extremely well wherever he goes. And that's exactly what he did in Vancouver. Right. Oh, so. oh yeah. Insane. And kudos to Chuck Fletcher too, though, because Chuck Fletcher added some very key pieces there so that he needed to add, you know, and uh, so he brought in a very good coach in Elaine Vigneault to me was the most underrated signing, you know, in the off season. Why? Because they needed a coach to guide them to direct the ship. So uh, if you want me to be quite frank, I think he was the, the best off season addition that uh, a, a GM could have made was hiring Elaine. I loved Vigneault. it. I loved it. So, I loved it as much as what happened here in Edmonton with Tippett. Um, I put uh, them both on the same yeah, thing. Got a really good coach here. I like, so I had it down to Tippett and Vigneault. Um, yeah. after, after I pretty much knew that Joel Coinville wasn't going to come here and that started to come to fruition, uh, I'd say around when the season really ended, it was either he would come or not. And then after the first few weeks after the season was over for the Flyers, you knew that Joel Coinville wasn't coming here. So, and that's when I became a Tibbet and, you know, a Vigneault lover. I, I would have been happy with either or and why, because both are defensive style coaches first. Both believe in the defensive system 
uh, and that that'll lead to the offensive system. It's not that they're just defensive. It's mm-hmm. just that you got to focus on the the simple aspects of the game. Defense wins championships, and yep. if you have a good defense, and it's not. And I'm not just talking about defensemen. I'm talking about a team defense. Five people on the ice. If you yep. have a good team defense, it'll lead to offense. If you have yep. a good netminder, your defense will bail him out. You know when he's struggling, and that's what happens. And then that's what's happened with Edmonton. It's no shock that they're. A, a good team, you know, this year it's, I'm not shocked by it by any means because coaching does a lot. You look at, um, you look at what Bruce, you know, you, you look at but Barry Trotz, you know, for the Isles, look how good they are, you know, oh. Barry Trotz, you know, he's a very good coach, you know, look what he, look what he did to them. And, you know, they lose a Tavares and didn't lose a step at all. You know, like there, there's a reason why they didn't. It's because of coaching. They had no business being in the playoffs, honestly. No, not Barry, at Barry all. Trotz is insane. And they played well. And they yeah. played well. And, and and they should be, you know, decent this go around too. Yeah. Oh, um, the problem Barry Trotz had in the Islanders was that he was he had guys that shouldn't have been playing that many minutes for a whole season and they started to fade at the end. Yeah. I mean, not much a coach can do about that. Uh yeah. you know, Tortorella, A V, like these guys are like cream of the crop right yeah. uh yeah. that's and and he went out and what i'm saying about that is chuck fletcher went out and got one and you know amazing for him amazing uh that uh maybe it just fell in his lap i don't know but uh you know because uh av probably had his options though and for whatever reason chuck was able to get him to come over to philadelphia and that's yeah, fantastic that's the best move it was the best move for philly it was the best move for that locker room it was the best move for the veterans. Uh, you mm-hmm. look, and uh, it's not easy standing up the veterans, but at times he's had to stand up to, uh, you know, in the beginning of the season. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of, like, you know, the situation. Obviously, it was good because Jake played uh, the best two-way game of his career, I believe, you know, was this year. And he's always had a nice two-way game, but this year he stepped it up a notch. And uh, JBR. And for instance, uh, started to play better, you know, a, a better two way game as well. He wasn't just offensive. He became a, a, a really good defenseman, but he also his vision of the ice improved because he was making passes that I, I haven't seen him make in his entire career. So there is a, a connection there with both those players. And it was really good to see really good. And Jake, Jake's very honest. Anyway, first 15, 20 games, he told me he sucked and, uh, you know, he was sluggish. Didn't know why. And then after that, he said, I played well. And he did. I, I think the guy that's that, coaching. That's I think coaching. the guy that AV got the best out of, I mean, yep. all, all of these guys, but one guy that really just he connected with and hit perfect, got the really the most of them was Hayes. I, I really, oh, yeah. the way that guy, the, the improvement in his game, and he was always a good player, okay? But what, how he was playing in Winnipeg, to how he played in Philadelphia in one year, wow! I mean, kudos to him for 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 his work on himself as well. But I that is a, exactly the kind of uh, player building that I've seen in AV over and over and over again. Um, I would attribute a lot of that to AV. Would you? Wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely, no doubt. They have a connection because he's uh, AV was a head coach of the Rangers. Obviously, right. Kevin right. Hayes played there. When he, and that's when he potted his career high of 25 goals. Right. And he finished this year with 23. He more than likely probably would have potted in excess of 25 goals and he would have had a new career high this year. I presume he probably would have ended near 31, 32 goals, is my opinion, because he was on a tear late in the season anyway. But um, in any sense, uh, that's what coaching does. And, uh, you know, he gets his players to play. And I think that that was a big reason that, that's why Kevin Hayes signed, you know, with Philadelphia. It wasn't just because of his family. It was because he had a coach that he was familiar with and that could bring the best out of him. And A.V. Shore did that just straight in training camp. Uh, he became – he was giddy. He was funny. He, he's the funniest player in the NHL. He was just voted a few days ago for a reason, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, the locker room was toxic last year and not toxic this year. It was fresh and vibrant, and Kevin Hayes is that guy. You look at him during mic'd up, you know, um, just the way he's chirping, the way he 
gets players to play around him. Uh, he was just – it was great for A.V. to have Kevin Hayes because Kevin Hayes was familiar with his system, and he, yeah. it, could, it could have helped him aid, implement his system quicker. Uh, the Flyers, you know, could have struggled in Prague, could have struggled, you know, through the first month of the season, but they did not. They finished one game above 500 at the end of October, and I give a lot of credit to A.B. and Kevin Hayes for that. Because Kevin Hayes, no doubt, helped implement, you know, Elaine Vigneault's system. And, uh, you know, when these veterans like Claude Giroux, Jake Voracek, uh, JBR, uh, learn a system and they learned Hackstall's system and now you got to learn a new system. And these are veteran type players. It's not just so easy, you know, to just say, OK, give me a new coach. I'll learn his system. No, it takes time. Kevin Hayes could have aided that being that he's familiar with AV system from the time that he spent with the New York Rangers. So, yeah, I, I, I think Kevin Hayes rubbed off on Elaine Vigneault and Elaine Vigneault, you know, rubbed off on Kevin Hayes there. It, it, it was a match made in heaven. Yeah. I, I admit um, when I, when I, when they first made it, I was a little iffy about that contract, but uh, he's been, he's been absolutely fantastic. Very underrated, yes. extremely underrated player for the, not just for that team, but in the NHL in general, um, his defensive game is, it was, it was always good. But to add the offense to his transition game has increased so much yeah. in Philadelphia. Um, it's been it's been fun to watch. It's been yeah. fun to watch. Um, I wanted to, a couple things that have happened in the last little while, guys. I want to talk about um, Linus Sandy. What it, that uh, picking him up uh, uh, as a free agent? How did uh, how how do you think about that? Oh, you're talking about the six foot one, uh, two hundred and nine pound Swedish star. Is that <laughs> yeah, because that's exactly what he is. Uh, he plays in a men's league. He played in. He is arguably played in the third toughest league in the world. Uh, he potted nineteen goals in a men's league, seventeen mm-hmm. assists, thirty six points in fifty one games played. That is insane numbers at the SHL level. That is comparable to about a hundred and twenty. CHL points, in my opinion, uh, you know, in the CHL. And I'm not knocking the league or whatnot, but it is very hard to put up those type numbers in the SHL. It is very uncommon to put up those type numbers. He's 24 years old. He's a seasoned guy because of his age. He could come in and grab, a, a, you know, a bottom six role with the Philadelphia Flyers uh, easily at, at a training camp. He should be able to compete for a bottom six job at training camp. And I think that he was brought in because Tyler Pitlick is going to be getting a raise here. He he is 27 years old himself, or just turned 28. He makes $1 million. Uh, you got Derek Grant, who makes, uh, what, $750,000. He's on a one-year deal. So Derek Grant has potted 15 goals and chipped in 10 assists. 15 goals. We'll probably get him close to two million dollars, two and a half million, you know, uh, per year. And I, I and I presume at his age, he's what thirty years old. He's looking for a multi-year contract. I don't know if I'm Chuck Fletcher. I, I I'm a little weary of adding multi-year contracts because of the flyer system, and that is kudos to Ron Hextall as well, and uh, uh, lots of kudos to Ron Hextall. You're figuring you got Tanner Lazinski down there who's 20, 22, 23 years old, who should yeah. be able to come up at some point next season and play for the Flyers if need be, uh, because he's played in the NCAA. He played in the men's league as well. So you have a Wade Allison as well, who's 22, 23 years old, who should be able to come in and play, you know, and play at times, you know, for the Philadelphia Flyers too. Not to mention you got a David Kasha, you got Connor Bunham and Carson Swarinski, who's all seen time with the Flyers this year. So to, fag, to just automatically re-sign a Tyler Pitlick or Derek Grant is going to cost money, and it's going to cost term because both players are looking for multi-year contracts, and there will be teams that will give them the multi-year contract. This is where Linus Sandin comes in, and Linus Sandin can come in. He is a winger who adds size for the Philadelphia Flyers, and the Flyers need size on the wing anyway, but they've also needed natural goal scorers. 
And that is what Sandine is. He is a natural goal scorer. He may not provide the 70, 60 points or 50 points that Oscar Lindblom would put up. You know, I don't think that he's got the, the, I don't think he's got the ceiling of an Oscar Lindblom to play on a second line on a daily basis like Oscar Lindblom did, but he is a very good bottom sixer. There is no reason why he can't finish his career with at, at the NHL level in a bottom six role. I'm yeah. figuring he's going to play on a third line for the Philadelphia Flyers, in my opinion, next season. And I would not be shocked if he wins a job straight out of camp because they the Flyers are built with a lot of Swedish young players here. There's a reason Robert Haig swayed him to come here. And, and, and the, the Flyers are littered with Swedes throughout their system. And I think he's going to have – feel very comfortable at home you know here with Philadelphia Flyers in my opinion yeah um yeah I I see him as a third line guy as well um really like his intensity um and uh you know putting up those points as a 24 year old is rare (laughs) it's NHL level uh offense to be able to put in this uh system now I I I can't say I've watched tons of Linus Sandin or what have you but I have read quite a bit of from scouting about him and it all seems to be pretty much the same thing if he can if he can be a third line guy uh he can be a third line guy that can put up 15 maybe even throw a 20 goals season in there somewhere along the line um and if he has to you can put him up on the top you can put him on the second power play unit if need be if you have injuries and stuff like that so yeah that makes sense um i love Pitlick. uh i he, he I do was too. In, I he do was too. in Edmonton, and you just can't help but love the guy. I do too. No I do too. About it. We yeah. ha- the Flyers have to look ahead, Steve, and you know what I'm talking about in yeah. terms of Carter Hart's going to be owed a contract here. Carter Hart's going to be owed a contract in the next in, in the next after next season. You know, right. so they have one more year of Carter Hart, and then you know that then they have to re-sign him. And I'm not saying yeah. he's going to break the bank because usually your first contract you usually typically don't break the bank, but with a franchise goaltender. I wouldn't be surprised if he's making near six or seven million per year, you know, for his first contract. I'm not saying he's going to make the nine or 10 like he will on his no. second contract. No. So, but, no. so then they have Sean Couturier, who's coming, his contract's coming near to an end. And who did that contract? Who took that steal of a contract? Ron Hextall. What That's a steal that was. Four and a half million per year. This dude, I mean, to, to, to sign an elite center. To four and a half mil. That's crazy. But yeah. then Claude Giroux's contract ends, you know, shortly. You know, then then they have all these other ELCs ending here, you know, mm-hmm. as well. So you're going to yeah. have to be signed Travis Sanheim again because yeah. Travis Sanheim's last year is next after next season as well. You're going to have to re-sign Felipe Myers. You're going to have to re-sign, you know, eventually, you know, um, you'll have to re-sign. Let me see. Hag. Robert, yeah, Robert Haig, but he's not going to break the bank. You know, no, he'll, he'll, but it's he'll still see, money. He'll see a sizable, yeah. you know, he'll see a sizable, you know, nice size there, you know, yeah. but uh, they got to re sign all these other ELC in terms of like uh, Tanner Lazinski, you know, is, is only on a two year ELC. You know, then you got Wade Allison only on a two year ELC. And then you have all these other players, you know, on ELCs. And then you got, you know, Travis Konechny eventually is going to fall off the books again. So the Flyers have to be very, very careful in terms yeah. of how they spend and, and use their cap because you have you are littered with these a solid farm system, but it's but their ELCs are going to run out eventually. You know, and we're not counting a Nolan Patrick's ELC either because his ELC he's got to be re-signed at year's end. He's an RFA as well. So, you know, and then eventually they got, you know, NAK, you know, it, the, the list just goes on and on and on in terms of ELCs, you know. So the Flyers have to be, and of course, at years at this year's end, they also have Oscar Limbaugh's ELC, you know, who's an RFA as well. So it's not like they don't have in-house cleaning to do. They have some in-house cleaning, but Fletcher has to be wise. So, yes, it's easy to just say, oh, Pitlick only wants two million, two and a half. I think Pitlick can maybe earn close to three mil with the team. And I think a team like uh, I'm looking at a young team, the Jersey Devils might come a calling or the New York Rangers might come a calling, you know, for him or, you know, uh, or, or a Carolina Hurricanes. 
you know, might come a calling. You know, somewhere in, in the metropolitan division could come a calling. Who knows? I mean, but these are great problems for the Flyers to have. Am I mad if they walk? No. But in the end, you can't re-sign everybody. And wow. although I love a Tyler Pitlick and he's done everything, and I want, I would love to see him re-sign. Unfortunately, we can't. He can. Chuck Fletcher cannot re-sign everybody at year's end. He might have anywhere from eight to nine million dollars worth of cap space. Using three of that, now you're down to six. Then you got to re-sign Brian Elliott as well to possibly back up. You know, be be a backup for Carter Hart. So the list just goes on and on and on. Yeah. On terms of some in-house cleaning that the Flyers have to do. And I think also just from Tyler Pitlick's perspective, I'm sure he loves Philadelphia. And, uh, he does. He does. He I'm does. Sure he, he, told, does. he told but, me that. He said he loves the fans. He said the fans love me and I love them. That's yeah. what he told me in an interview in December. Of course. But in, oh, in, in Edmonton as well, I'll tell you that right now. He, absolutely. You cannot not love the guy. The guy is fantastic. Yeah. But um, he's looking at it like, where is his position in three, four years yeah, in Philadelphia, yeah. right? There's teams deal. out there. He probably – everybody wants to move up. Everybody wants to be the best that they can be. Tyler Pitlick certainly is one of those people. That's why we love him. And uh, I imagine he's going to have an opportunity out there to get a, a solid third-line role somewhere and become even a, a, a more impact player, maybe even second line. Heck, he put up 20 points. He put yeah. up 20 points with not that many minutes. He's a good five-on-five five producer. Somebody out there is going to give him some good money. Somebody's going yeah. to see what that kid, what that guy is all about right now. I agree. 100%. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think he'll probably move on, uh, unfortunately. But now... Jeez, we didn't. We got some. We're gonna have to do this again, my friend. We're getting so much, uh, so much stuff. I wanted to talk about uh, Nolan Patrick. Um, it sounds like he he's just out for a while longer yet. Is that right? Uh, you know what? Honestly, I, I'm in firm belief that he's gonna play for the playoffs. Oh, and, really? Uh, yes, I, I'm an oper- I will operate under that. I, I'm one of the rare runs. To be honest with you, uh, but I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you and say that. Uh, he should sit out. To me, if he's healthy, he should play. Why shouldn't he? Sure. Oh, to me, sure. I could, yeah. Steve, I could care less about chemistry. You know why? He's been around the team. He's been practicing with the team. He's been taking some hits in practice as well. David Isaac hinted that out. There's a picture of it. And for those who don't think that he has, there is a video of it from David Isaac. It's flat out there. Everyone has seen him have some contact at practice. So if he's healthy enough to play, he should play. He's a hell of a talent. He can make the Flyers. The, the Flyers are already cup contenders without Patrick. He could take them to the cup and possibly win it. That's how good Nolan Patrick is. This guy is so talented, and I will operate under the impression that until the Flyers tell me otherwise, I've always operated that way. Chuck Fletcher said that you know he expected Nolan Patrick to return. That, that, that was all the way up until the pandemic. And Fletcher operated under such, and so did Brent Flair. So until I'm told otherwise by the Philadelphia Flyers or Nolan Patrick himself, I'm under the impression that he's returning. And for those who don't think he should, why shouldn't he? He's been out over one year now. So their season ended. They didn't go to the playoffs, you know, in in 2018-19. So they, they missed the playoffs. So when did their season end? It ended in April. So, like, now we're in June, right? So he's had one year and two months off to get prepared and get prepared for the season, for the upcoming, you know, season ahead. The games won't begin until August. So he will have one month, one year and four months off from the time his last game was played. You don't think that he should play? Is there a reason why? Because every player is coming in like Nolan Patrick. Who is ready to play in August? Who is conditioned enough to play? They are all on equal levels. They are all on equal levels. And that includes Kevin Hayes. That includes Claude Giroux. You know, that includes Sean Couturier. That includes Ivan Provorov. Because everybody's going to come in sluggish because no one has seen game action since February or, or early March. Sorry, early March. So that's a long time. You're talking close to five months off, right? So what is the difference between Patrick playing and the other players playing? To me, there is none. He should play. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I I, I don't and know much about the reason that he has been cleared. So I saw that out there too. Why would why would Nolan Patrick get cleared for contact if there was no ice? You couldn't attend to a hockey rink. You couldn't go to a hockey rink. There was no hitting. The Flyers weren't on the ice. You know, so why would he get cleared from contact by his doctor? Because it's not just his doctor that says, yes, okay, you're ready to play. No, he's got to get screened by the Flyers doctors. So where were the Flyers doctors at that time? This is a pandemic. They're not screening Nolan Patrick. He's got to get cleared by the Flyers first in order to get cleared for contact, right? So during the pandemic, who was available? No one. So why would he get cleared by his doctor? For contact, there was no need to. So, and that's that's what that's the misconception that was given around from some fans. So, yeah, of course the Flyers are going to say, "I don't know, he's status quo." Why would they give an update when there was no update to give? Right. No one was skating. Right. You know, it's now the facilities are reopening. Now, in a few weeks, he comes back. You know, and stuff. And here he could get cleared by the doctors and everything. Yeah. So I'm yeah. operating under the impression that, uh, you know, until the Flyers tell me otherwise, I'm going to include Nolan Patrick in my 3C. And, and uh, you know, and, and that's why I haven't tweeted or, you know, put this on, you know, our site or whatnot, because Nolan Patrick is a question mark for me. But I'm operating that, you know, that, he, he he will play until the Flyers say otherwise. You know, we could all speculate, you know, and that's exactly what it is. It's pure speculation. You know, this team, although they had a lot of chemistry, you know, from, you know, the time that they were all together, this is a different world. They're coming back after five months off now. Everything is weird, you know, and stuff coming from the pandemic, you know. It's not just so easy to just say, okay, we could get back to where we were before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, oh, John, you know, this is a surprise to me. Thanks, uh, thanks for, for saying that. I mean, it's he's a good so, thing we weren't able to talented. get into. Like, he is so talented. He is so freaking talented. This dude Paul yeah. is right. a player. He was blazing fast. Honestly, I'm going to be honest. At my times in practice within this past season, you know, just watching him in practice, I've seen this kid a lot, okay? I've seen him grow from the time he was 16 years old, all right? I'm telling you, this was the fastest I've ever seen him was at practice. And I know it's only practice. I get it. But his shot was so freaking accurate. It was insane. And I know he it's only an incredible talent. But yeah. I'm telling you, a healthy Nolan Patrick could only aid the Flyers. And people call me crazy, and I understand that. I might get some heat for this or saying whatever but i'm gonna be honest with you uh I, that's how i've always operated i'm uh, a why uh, the flyers haven't lied to me ever right so why should i not take chuck fletcher or brent flair at their words right if he's in this chair is a whole new ballgame i mean even after a layoff and like you said this would be the perfect time to come in when everybody is on a, uh, everybody's pretty much on a layoff anyways yeah yeah. Um, you got Couturier, Couturier, Hayes, him, and Lawton as your top four. Friends. Tell me, yeah. tell me what team in the league can can beat with that type of? Uh, there are many. There are many. Steps in the middle. Eh? <laughs> it's uh, there might be some yeah. guys with some higher end guys, but I'm talking yeah. about the full depth. Lawton yeah. does not is a third line center. If he's playing on your fourth line. You've got a very good center playing on your fourth line, like yeah. better than ninety percent of the league's yeah. centers yeah. on the fourth line. Yeah. Fantastic depth at yeah. the middle, changes everything. And I'm glad we weren't able to get into uh, uh, matchups in the playoffs and stuff like that. We'll get into it next time because yeah. we want to know if he, if if uh, he's going to be in before we make this because it changes things a lot. Changes oh, things. Definitely. And that, that's why I'm saying it's so hard to say uh, who's going to go where because the lineups haven't been derived yet from any teams. And it, all it is is, honestly, Steve, it's pure speculation. Uh, this stuff just gives people to talk about, to include myself. It just right. gives me stuff to talk about, too. But I'm not – I will uh, – uh, uh, I'm going to tell your viewers I'm not coming out with lines until I know for a fact that Nolan Patrick is out. 
And, uh, you know, right now I have him in. And that's why I'm not tweeting anything is because I don't want to get people's hopes up and just say, okay, Patrick's in. You know, but if people ask me honestly what my lines were, and I I would factor in at this particular time, no one Patrick in a 3C role. Because, uh, you know, because that Chuck Fletcher and Brent Flair were operating under the impression that he was expected to return. And uh, so, and they never said that he would not. So until they actually tell me no, then to me, he's in. Awesome. Well, that's, I think we'll finish her up here, buddy. It is, you You have been a wealth of unbelievable information. Again, like usual, it's been fantastic to have you. Uh, Especially that Nolan Patrick stuff, that that helps a lot. Yeah, I just, you know what, I, I, I just hate, you know, Injuries are injuries. Uh, it's so hard to say. And, and this is to do respect to Nolan Patrick because he shouldn't have people talking about him behind his back. Because honestly, Steve, if you're bad, and I know you're not, I'm just using you as an example. If you badmouth Nolan, would you have the balls to say it to his face? Who's badmouthing Nolan? No, no, I'm just saying. I'm not saying uh, you, but I'm just I saying, know, but, oh, I he's not coming back. Oh, are, his career has ended. I've seen that. I've seen that. And I know you have too. On Twitter, yeah. saying he'll never make a return. How many times have you seen that? Well, yeah, I never understood that. Well, you what, know, what? so like, if if you can't, where I'm getting at is, if you can't, I'm not saying you, because you don't. I'm just, I'm just saying if a that person, it's if you, a person, right? If, okay. if a person says that about him, would they have the guts to say that to us and say, "Hey, you're not returning. You're not going to play this sport anymore." No. Yeah. So why should we say that? In the public, to the public, why? Because if we can't say it to the guy's face, then why say it at all? You know, like, you know, we all have jobs to do, and I understand it. And everybody's trying to get likes and tweets, you know, retweets and stuff. Everybody's trying to get themselves more known. But why do I do that stuff, you know, if I can't say it to him? That is to me to do justice to a lot of athletes. And, uh, that's probably why I have a really good rapport with a lot of athletes and their family members, for, for instance. And that's why, because with injuries, I never, ever, ever, ever do I ever tweet about an injury about a player or whatever or, or speculate or, hey, this person's hurt or, hey, you know that. No. Or I do due diligence with, with injuries mm-hmm. because I have gotten information from multiple, you know, members and stuff but i don't tweet that stuff because i don't have to you know why because they 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 trust me you know and that's what that's what i'm owning is a trust and i don't go around bad mouthing you know like and people call me that i'm too positive or something of that nature you know and yes i am positive because all the time i don't have to be negative honestly Mm -hmm. with this particular flyers team there's nothing negative about it so why should I have to get negative about it? You know, what? The, 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 there's not one weakness on this Flyers team. So, you know, in my opinion, you know. Yeah, but it, see, but what I always loved about you, man, is that, okay, yeah, you were very positive, but you're positive in every aspect of life anyways. Yeah, yeah. But if you did it in such a way that a lot of times you can just read in between the lines in – it, to, to be able to come up with maybe some things that may be p- problems or whatever the yeah. case may be. Like, but I don't think it's healthy or necessary to go on and rant about some things that may be a problem. You know, that's kind of the way I do my thing as well, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's, why you I, can, that's why I you respect can, what you do and stuff like that. You know, like I, I, I did call out Michelle Terry, you know, uh, you know, around December, January, when the uh, Flyers power play was, uh, you know, fl- uh, uh Go, you know, fluttering at that time. And why? Because I just thought that, in my opinion, he was a little too stubborn to go with what worked, you know, go with the old unit that worked. The Claude Giroux, Jake Borchek, Sean Couturier, ghost bombs, you know, and stuff, you know, like put that line, put that unit back together. And, uh, you know, but he eventually did. So kudos to him, you know, so he righted the ship for me, you know. So like um, I call out when, you know, I have to, but it's not very often because it's not very often I have to. But, right. and that's, you know, so I am bipartial, you know, that way. But, like, in terms of, like, 
Nolan Patrick, I'm not going to, you know, just sit here and say he's not coming back when no one knows if he is or isn't, you know, I never, like I never, never, I never saw because an injury why. is an injury. This is an unpredictable event. This yeah. is an unpredictable injury that happened to him, you know, and, and it's so unpredictable that the doctors don't even know at times. It's only Nolan Patrick that knows, you know, because he's the only one that feels and knows what's going on in his head. The doctors, yeah. one can only make an insinuation on what's going on based off the information that they have collaborated with them. You know, right. so like this is an unpredictable event that Nolan Patrick will know if he's healthy enough to play or not. And I trust Nolan Patrick. Uh, I looked at him in the eyes in, you know, February when he, you know, gave his, uh, you know, when he gave a speech to the media. And it's so hard to hear him. You know, when you keep getting asked these questions, are you healthy? Are you healthy? Are you healthy? Yeah, he got a little frustrated uh, there for. Uh, yeah, he uh, did for for good reason because I can only imagine what he's going through. We have, I personally have never experienced what he's going through, so it's easy for me to rip him and just say, "Oh, look at him," you know, or something, you know, or whatever. But no, I try to put myself in his shoes. I don't know what I would do if I keep getting asked the question, "Are you healthy? Are you healthy? Are you healthy?" You know, so this is due diligence. Where I'm getting at, and I know I'm going on a rant, but. uh it's due diligence to Nolan Patrick. I'm uh, protecting Nolan Patrick because uh, he should be protected in such a way. Because if he did come back, and then I say he's not coming back, and then what happens? He comes back, and now I look like an, a fool, to be honest. So, uh, you know, and I'm not going to operate that way because I don't have to. Yeah. I never knew there was really any, I, I don't, I never knew there was really indica any indication that he wouldn't come back. Um, yeah, I, be I believe he's going to come back. He was taking hits happen. in practice. He was skating. He knows his team. He's been around the team. Uh, Chris Stewart helped him out a lot, um, you know, in terms of his, you know, injury and getting his mind focused. So um, they're they're very good players. It's a tight knit bunch. I'm, I was honored to come on your show. I'm honored to have you, and I'm glad you expressed that for for Nolan's sake. I mean, the guy. I don't know. I don't know how you. The guy got to where he did by having incredible character his whole career. Yeah, it his, tears me up that uh, and junior and all of that stuff like that. To up. question this guy really? and his character is to me, I don't get it. I mean, it tears I'm, me up. Uh, just it's looking good. for a story yeah. on the back of a guy exactly. that's all doing it the best he can. That's what it seems like to me, man. Yeah. Okay, buddy. You are awesome. Take care. We are going to do this again for sure. And I'd love to go on that podcast if you have that idea <laughs> to do that. I'd be a few weeks, Steve. I'll let you know. I'll, I'll DM you. Make sure you are checking out that podcast and this guy's writing on Twitter. Jamie at Jamie Basco. Just look it up on Twitter. Fantastic stuff. Absolutely fantastic. I love him. Love to have him. Glad to have you. And I'm glad to have all you guys watching too. Thanks for showing up today. Thanks for sticking in for the full hour. I hope you did because you you can't miss this stuff. Have a great day. Lots of love to you. Take care, everybody.